Hey everybody, Mr. Hayes here, Hayes' World of Math. We are going through the Stats Medics curriculum this year for AP Statistics, and today we are going to talk about how you actually, how you, the consumer, get to calculate our confidence interval. I know, I've teased it for two episodes now, we're finally there. And we're going to do it with food, what could be better? Um... In this experiment, what you would normally end up doing is you get 50 Hershey's Kisses, which I think is about half, maybe two-thirds of a, one of those standard bags of Hershey's Kisses. And you would throw them all up in the air, and you're going to see how many of them land flat. Now, if you need a copy of this, links down below, um, down in the PDF, along with all sorts of other fun stuff that hopefully that you will do it. And while you're down there, hit subscribe, like, comment, you know, all that other good stuff. Share it with your friends, your grandmother, your dog. It doesn't matter. So anyway, um, what I would end up doing is we'd have each group of four get 50 Hershey's Kisses, and yes, you get to eat them afterwards, um, and you'd toss them up in the air and see how many landed flat side down. So I did this, and I ended up getting 22 out of 50 of them landed flat. That turns out to be a proportion of 0.44, 44%. And again, since we're doing it, it's not based on the population. This is an estimate of the population. We're going to say that this proportion is p hat now one of the first things that we always do regardless of if it's a test or a confidence interval what's a test mr hayes we'll learn about that later is we're going to go through and we're going to list out what the population and parameter is and what the um, sample and the statistic is population is all the hershey's kisses as in like everyone out there parameter is going to be the true proportion that would land flat 50 Hershey's Kisses is our sample, and then P hat, in our case, turns out to be 44%. All right? And this is nice because it does a couple of things. It does help focus you on um, things that you're going to be needing to use later um, in terms of interpretations. It also organizes everything very nicely. And it also then demonstrates to the reader that, hey, you understand what, what we can control and what we're trying to study. Okay. Now, is this random sample? Is this sample random? Is this sample a random sample? That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so anyway, yeah, what, um, we randomly sampled 50 Hershey's Kisses so we can generalize the population. This is why. And this is actually condition number one. When you're doing a confidence interval, that's an ugly C. That's going to be condition number one. Man, I'm going to fix that because now it looks like Odition. Okay. Yeah, it looks better. Um, so you need to say, you know, it's totally random. Now, sometimes we can do it. Um, it's just simply, you know, you can say, yeah, this would be a, a random sample of the ones that we would get. Um, sometimes it will say it up in the problem itself. So that needs to be stated just so that we know that we're not like handpicking special ones. Right now, what's the formula for calculating out the standard deviation of a sample distribution? Now, the standard deviation is going to be uh, sigma, sigma pi hat. So the formula is going to be sigma of pi hat, and that's going to equal. And this is not going to be a big surprise. Um, we're going to take the proportion. And remember, what we normally do is we take the square root of the proportion times the balance the proportion um, and divide it all through by n. Um, and so we're going to be using that today as well. Sorry, my water's in the way. So what condition must be met to use that formula? Remember, we have a 10% condition. You have to show that you're not, to use this, we have to show that by not replacing things, um, it, it's not going to be affecting the results. And so you have to have at least under 10% of that working on there. So that's actually condition number two. It's the 10% condition. 50 is definitely less than one-tenth of all Hershey's Kisses produced. At least I would hope so. So 10% condition was met. So now we don't know what P is. Okay. So the question is, you know, we need that for the confidence interval. So what we're going to do is we're going to use P hat instead. So let's calculate out the standard deviation. Now, obviously, if you're doing this along at home, you're going to use whatever your p or whatever your p hat value is. So if you ended up getting 0 0.40, you're going to use 0 0.40. Um, I'm going to use the 0 0.44. And so in this case here, 
sigma p hat is equal to p hat times one minus p hat all over n. And then, so that's 44% times 56% divided by 50 and going through here. Public service announcement here. Let me switch over here to the calculator. When you do this, I would do it this way, okay? Because I had people doing this incorrectly and actually only getting a square root on one part of this. And so I would go through and I would do the top part first, hit enter, divide it through by my 50, enter. And then at that point, I'm gonna take my square root of my answer. And remember, your answer button down here is the second version of the negative sign. And so when I do that, I'm going to get my answer of 0 0.0701, actually 0 0.07, 0 0 0.0702. And we're gonna go out to three significant figures since that's what we're measuring um, most of these um, proportions in. But what that's going to do is that that's going to help make sure that everything that's supposed to be underneath the square root is actually under the square root. Okay, so just something to keep in the back of your head if it's not working for you. This is going to turn out to become something called the standard error, which we're going to formalize on the other side. And then the last thing we do is, like, would it be appropriate to use a normal distribution for this? Because that's the other thing. We don't know if this is normally distributed or not. What allows us to say something can be norm that we can assume we can use the normal distribution for it. And so what you're going to end up doing is this large counts. Remember, large counts is saying that you have at least 10 um, events that happen both in the fail and the success category. So for that, we get this. So n times um, p hat has to be bigger than or equal to 10. n times um, 1 minus p hat has to be bigger than or equal to 10. So again, this is condition 3. Hey, I learned how to write my c's. And so for that, 50 times 44% is 22. And sometimes this, I mean, you need to show the math, even though you're like, but Mr. Hayes, you had 22 way up here at the top. Why do I have to go through and do the math again? Well, because that's just kind of one of the things, because you want to jump through the hoops. And is that really something you want to go head to head with, especially you as a student? And you know, they're just sometimes it's just easier to do it. I'm sorry to say. Anyway, so then here, the balance of the 50 is gonna be 28. So both of those are bigger than 10. And so yes, those are appropriate. Now, some of you guys might be saying, well, Mr. Hayes, we really haven't done lots of calculation. Where's the confidence interval? Well, guess what? That's where we're going next. Now, the big question here becomes, how do we use it and how do we come up with it, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, we're gonna to have to take a step back and we're gonna take a look at our normal distributions and z-scores again. So what we're gonna do is, if you remember from before, sorry, I put that too low. I have my monitor over here so I can see my calculator in front of me, so I can't see it quite so easily. Um, and normal distribution, 95% of the data, remember, usually is two standard deviations with the mean. Now, I can't remember if I've said it, I know I said it in class, and I know it depends on maybe some of your teachers have done it too, is that this is a rounded value that you can actually figure it out that is close to two, but not exactly two. So the question is, how do we figure out what these critical values are? And these are called critical values, okay? Why? Because they're extremely important for trying to find out what we're looking for. So we're gonna use table A or inverse norm for that. So depending upon your type of calculator is going to depend upon what you do for this. So if I want 80% of the data lies within blank standard deviations of the mean, that means that, again, so I've got my mean here, right? So I wanna know how far to the right and to the left that is. So I've got 80% in the middle. So how much does that leave for each tail? Okay, that leaves 20% that's split evenly, 10% here, 10% here. And again, that should look somewhat familiar because we did that back when we introduced standard deviations. Now, depending upon your type of calculator, some of you guys might be able to use the middle. Some of you guys are gonna to have to show the leading tail and I'm going to show you both, all right? I know, I don't charge extra for that. Don't worry about it. So anyway, since my F keys that I control my scenes with always move things around, let's clear this out. So we're gonna go back over to inverse norm. And again, you can also do just table A. So what you would end up doing is that, let me come back here quickly. If you were doing table A, you would actually look up in the, in, within the Z table itself, 0 0.10, and that would give you um, the negative Z score on this side. You could also look up 90% and get the positive Z score on that side. Anyway, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use inverse norm. So that's option number three. And again, remember, you can press the keys down here to pull these things up. Now. 
for some of you, if you don't have the update in the TI-84 um, software, you're going to just see these first three options, if I remember correctly. Also, that will be the case if you're in a TI-83. So what you're going to end up doing is that you're going to find just the area on the left, and so we're going to go down and we'll hit paste. And when we run it, we're going to get an answer of negative 1.282. And again, generally, we're going to go to three decimal places for this. Um, and we're always going to take the positive because we know that since it's, we're trying to find the 80% in the middle, it's going to be the same number of standard deviations to the left and to the right. Okay. Now, if you ended up having the middle, it would look like this. So I would go to distribute. Again, I would still go to inverse T or inverse norm. I'm sorry, inverse T is something else. And you could type in the 80%. And we want the 80% in the middle. So when we do that, it's going to hit this. And boom. Notice they give you both the negative and the positive values. Okay, And it's the same number. So whichever way you feel more comfortable doing, please do that. Um, so let's get back to our notes. So I've already wrote, written in the 1.28 standard deviations from the mean. For the rest of this, we've asked you to go through and find some of the more common confident percentages of confidence intervals. And so you do them the exact same way. So 90% of the data lies within 1.645 standard deviations of the mean. And again, you'd have 90% here in the middle. So then you'd have tails of 5%. And that's how, and then you do whichever version of the calculator that you have there. For 95% lies within 1.96% of the standard deviation. 1.960 standard deviation is the mean. So again, notice this in two. We always said that the one, two, and three numbers were rough estimates. Um, just a quick way to kind of keep it in your head to see if you're doing it right. And then 99% falls 2.576 standard deviations from the mean. And again, I found all of these using the inverse norm. We are going to do this enough that I would guess for sure these two numbers are going to become etched into your brains and you won't have to necessarily look those up. Obviously do it if you're not sure. I will also say that there's probably at least on tests and probably the AP exam there will be one instance where it's going to be you know they might give you 97 and a half percent or something just so that you can demonstrate that you know how to do this. Okay. All right last couple of things. Now here is where you get your money's worth. Calculate out the margin of error for a 95% interval by multiplying the critical value and standard deviation you found show you will work. So, boom. Here is, because 95% I'm going to use, oops. For 95%, I'm going to use 1.960 standard deviations. That is my um, standard deviation from the previous page. And so when I multiply this out, I get a margin of error of 0.138 over 2.8%. Okay. So up over here, little note. Margin of error equals your critical value times the standard error. Okay. And in symbols, that would be Z star times standard error SP, da, 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 boom, like that. And it's Z star saying that's a critical value that you're going to be using within your calculations. Okay. Find the 95% confidence interval using the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. So point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. When I do that, I get those numbers, which means that my margin of error is going to fall between 0 0.302 and 0 0.578. And we'll talk about what that means. And remember, what does that mean? I'm 95% confident that the true proportion of Hershey's Kisses that would land flat side down falls between 0 0.302 and 0 0.578. Okay. Um, and again, the formula for this, and again, we'll formalize this a little bit on the other side, but it is going to be p hat plus or minus this over here, so z star times the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat, all divided by n. And this, again, is my confidence interval.
four proportions. Proportions. Okay. That is going to be one that you're going to come and know and love. Add your interval to the graph on the board. Sketch the graph below. I sketched what we did here last year. And we will add the one that I just did in here. And so I had 44%, which would be right about here. And it goes all the way down to three point, well, basically let's call it 30, up to about 58, so right about there. Oops, you can't see that, so I'm gonna just draw. There we go. So now the question becomes, what do we think the true proportion is? Isn't that the million dollar question? Now we're 95% confident that all of these contain the true proportion. So the big question is, where is their overlap between ideally all of them, but if not most of them? And so as you see it here, you can be like, well, wait a second. Kind of got, that's the same in everything and that's the same in everything. So then you'd be like, okay, well, probably let's just kind of scoot down the middle right about there. And that is going to be my estimate for P. So when we say, what do you think the true number of true proportion of kisses that land flat, we would say, okay, P equals 0 0.36, okay? Now I know that was a longer experience than normal, but obviously when you're dealing with one of the most important things and trying to learn the math behind it, it's not a bad thing to spend a little extra time on it. So I'll see you over in the formalized section. I promise that that will be a little bit shorter. It'll be more like the traditional length. Obviously, subscribe, like, comment, share with your friends, colleagues, whomever. We'll talk to you soon.